This is the Dirtbike Channel Podcast. You made it. You were listening to it. Congratulations to you. <laughs> oh, I'm going to do a Would You Rather podcast today. I did. I filmed the video for this. It's Would You Rather Yamaha YZ250FX or the Kawasaki KX250X. I get this question actually quite a bit in my email. I've had phone conversations with several of you out there about this exact topic. You know, one of the interesting things to me on this is both of these bikes made my top 10 bikes of all time, at least so far. I just did that video, repeated it, you know, kind of updated it just a few weeks ago. And I, maybe a month ago or so, I don't know. It's hard to know. All, all the days blend into one. But I did um, kind of cover this, refresh it. And both of these bikes, the KX, Kawasaki KX250X and the Yamaha YZ250FX, both of my top 10. And I have not yet done the full review for the, the Kawasaki, right? That video is still forthcoming. Um, and I'm still compiling my thoughts for that. I wanted to be able to ride the bike just a little bit more. I wanted to get it into some mountain single track. Not, I, I think I can still do that with my schedule. We got a family vacation coming up. Um, and I've actually tweaked my knee just a little bit. I had, uh, the other day I just tweaked my knee, um, a little bit of a, maybe a meniscus tear or something on the knee, went and had some, uh, had a physical therapist look at it today. I think it's going to be fine. I've been icing it, doing some stretches and things, the ACL, MCL, PCL, those all seemed good and intact to him anyway. But the point is I'm, I've got to take it easy for a little bit. And then I've got these, uh, this family trip coming up. So I'm trying, uh, I've left a bunch of hours on that Kawasaki, left the hours low so I could take it up, up in the mountains and do some fun stuff before I give it away in June. I, Cause I don't know if you've heard or not, but you can enter to win that bike. So if you go to my website before, um, before June 30th of this year, 2021, if you're listening right now in kind of that format, if you're hitting this before June 2021, June 30th, 2021, you can go to my website, dirtbikechannel.com, and you can get entered to win this Kawasaki and a KTM 125 dirt bike and a KTM 1290 Super Adventure S, a street bike. Pretty amazing deal. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, also, if you want to support Dirt Bike Channel, the way that this podcast rolls and the way that I roll my you know, YouTube channel is through those you know, sweepstakes and through like parts links and affiliates links. Um, you can also support me on Patreon, PayPal. I've got, if you go to my website, dirtbikechannel.com, you've got a few options there, but if you're shopping for parts, Hey, go to Rocky mountain ATV, but first go to my website. You can either click the links in like my video descriptions, uh, and on YouTube, typically the links are in these podcast, you know, descriptions, but nobody's really click on links in the descriptions. I don't think of these podcasts, but if you go to my website, dirtbikechannel.com, I have links over there where it's boom, sends you over to Rocky mountain ATV. If you would remember to do that, we'd be best friends because, <laughs> because you're helping to support me. So I get a referral bonus for that, um, for sending you over there. If you do that. So Rocky mountain ATV is awesome. So let's jump right into this. And again, this isn't the full review of this bike uh, of the Kawasaki. I had the Yamaha last year. Um, I've been able to ride a couple different Yamahas, a couple different YZ250 FXs since that time. Um, and amazing bikes. And cool thing is these bikes actually remind me a lot of one another. I almost feel like the engineers have been doing a little double dipping or whatever because they are so similar in so many ways. They're more similar than a lot of the other bikes that I've been testing, which is, you know, kind of interesting, but do, I do both like them. I'm going to compare five different areas with these motorcycles. We're going to cover motors, suspension, chassis, transmission, and then just a slight little thing in here on air boxes to bring it in home. And then I will declare the one which I would rather have. You'll be able to maybe deduce it by the time we start getting towards the end. I'm going to give each one of these a score. So you could get a score of one. I mean, a maximum score on this particular little thing would be a score of five because I'm, we're covering five different areas. Uh, there are going to be some ties in here. Um, and so on a tie, then each the Yamaha and the Kawasaki can get us, you know, one point in that little section. Um, so that's how I'm going to roll this thing out. This, this uh, podcast will probably come out before the YouTube video. And then you guys will be in the know and, it's the cool thing to do to, to subscribe to my podcast. So share this with your friends and whatever. I mean, if you're, if you're already here, you've probably subscribed, but if you haven't subscribed, click on that and then get all the podcasts that come down. So it's kind of a fun format. I almost like the pod 
podcast conversationalist style a little bit better than the YouTube videos. It's certainly a lot less work for me because I don't have to do like a billion hours in, of editing. On some of these YouTube videos, I got 200, 300 edits and cuts in, in there. And on this, I just talk into the stinking thing and, you know, <laughs> export it out to MP3 and, and there we go. So much easier. So let's talk about the motors. So the motors, okay? Both motors pull really hard. Both motors are very snappy and very playful and very fun. I love both of these motors. Um, they've got like a snap to them, a playful characteristic that some of the motors don't have. Like last year with the Sherco, I had the Sherco 300 SEF. The Sherco wasn't as nearly as a snappy and peppy of a motor as both of these motors that we're talking about on the Yamaha and on the Kawasaki. Really, really, really cool motors, and I like them both. They both pull very hard. And I have to be honest, and I've said this before, don't want to sound like a broken record, but there are so many times when I'm riding, when I was riding both of those 250s, where I've just been like, you know, you go up a hill and you just like lay in the throttle, roll on it, and it just like pulls so hard, second gear, third gear. And I'm just like, why would you want, you know, the bigger motor here, the 450 version of this bike? I mean, let's face it. It's more power than most of us are ever going to need. It just is. There's more power on a 450 than you need in 99% of the situations that you come to. And there's more power on these 250s than 95% of the situations that you come to. I, I, I'm only able to kind of use the bike at maybe 30% of its potential, you know? And so if I get a 450, I'm going to be using the bike at 20% of its potential or 15% of its potential. I don't know. And it's just going to wear me out. But they both make super good power. But I've got to give the advantage to the Yamaha. And the reason why is mainly because of the Yamaha Power Tuner app. So it's a free app. You download it on your phone. I know it's available for Apple. That's what I use. It's probably, I'm sure it's got to be available for Android as well. You download that app and then your bike, your phone, you connect your phone to your bike off of a little Wi Fi signal. And now you can try all kinds of different maps. It comes standard with four different maps. I believe two of them are kind of like, hotter maps and two of them are colder maps. You can modify those maps. You can look online. People have like created things and you can adjust timing. You can adjust fuel, uh, you know, ignition timing and fuel. It's really, really cool and super easy to do over on the Kawasaki. They give you the, these little modules that you plug in, like these little plugs that you plug into the bike. You get a black one, a white one and a green one. They literally just put different color tape on these things. And then they just say soft, medium, and hard in their documentation. And I have swapped those things out left, right, and center. And it's really hard for me to really get a grasp of what is happening. I can tell something's happening. I can tell it's changing the power characteristics. But I don't really know what it's doing. And it just when I thought I knew exactly which one I liked, which one was a hotter one, which, wasn't a cool, which one was a cooler one, then I started playing with them more. And I'm like, I really don't know. I ask five different people what these ignition, what these power modules do, these, these clip in plugs do. If I ask, if I ask five different people what they do, I'm going to get six different answers. <laughs> oh my gosh. And some people will think they really, really know. And other people think I don't know there. I mean, yes, you can go out and you can buy a Kawasaki. I believe they call it a, a calibration kit or wonder whatever, but it's like 700 bucks. And I'm just like, dude, you've got this thousand dollar computer in your pocket already, which is your cell phone. Why can't we just tune the motor, you know, and honestly, everyone should be doing this. KTM should be doing this. Honda should be doing this. I don't mention Suzuki because I don't know if they, I don't know if they, I don't know if those guys at Suzuki even have smartphones yet. They, I know that Suzuki, or at least I think Suzuki thinks that their customers don't have smartphones because they haven't updated anything since the flip phone era. But the point is, motors, they're both awesome motors between the Yamaha and the Kawasaki, but I got to give I got to give the the edge to the Yamaha just because of the motor, the engine management that, you know, software that they allow you to tap into. That is really really cool, and so I'm going to give a one score right here to the YZ and the Kawasaki doesn't get one, and it's not because the motor isn't good, it's just 
I mean, we're splitting hairs here and we're just saying, hey, one of them you can really adjust and do some cool things with and the other one you can't. You got these little plug clips in that you plug in and here they are. See, I'll, I'll let you... This is what they sound like when you're hitting them together. And this is what they sound like when they hit my desk right there. That's what you're adjusting it with versus using your iPhone or your Samsung Galaxy phone or whatever. So motors, let that's going to the yammy hammy, the yammy hammy. Okay, moving on to suspension. Okay, on the YZ250FX and the Kawasaki KX250X, they use KYB forks on both of these. Interesting side note, on the Kawasaki 450 version of this bike, the Kawasaki KX450X, it isn't KYB. They don't use that. But on the 250, they do. And so they've used the same basic fork components. Um, and shocks, I, I think they're both, you know, KYB shocks too. And they're valved extremely similarly. I mean, again, the, I think they were kind of like, you know, one guy was, you know, the Kawasaki guy was going home at night and sending an email to the Yamaha guy and say, hey, what'd you guys do today? You know, like, what are, what are the settings you're running? And, and those, <laughs> those people were spying on each other, maybe. And they've done something very, very similar. Good news is they did some really good things. Now, they're valved a little bit stiffer um, than what you'd want if you're going to do slow riding. You know, these bikes are valved and set up for more aggressive. I mean, I know it's softer than a motocross setting or a supercross setting, but I mean, if this is, if you think that you're going to get either one of these bikes as your very first bike and it'll be valve for you to go slow, you're going to be sorely mistaken. You won't know it if it's your first bike because you won't know any different, but these bikes are not like super soft plush couches. Yeah, they're softer than a motocross bike. They've softened the valving up, um, but for uh, you know, like a hard enduro bike, that's not what these are valve for. They're valve for going faster, like second gear, third gear, fourth gear type stuff. They're not really valve that well for first gear, you know, um, sharp hits on ledges and and like things like that. So, but that's fine. I mean, I get it. Like, if I'm gonna ride either one of these bikes, I'm you know I'm gonna go out and do some more some faster stuff, like some desert type stuff you know, some more flowing open single track stuff where it's not super tight. Um, you know, I can, it can do super tight single track, but the point is if I'm going to have a lot of choppy rocks and ledges that I'm, you know, hitting and sharp, sharp edges type thing, then maybe this is not, you know, going to be the bike I take, but they both are, have a ton of hold up on. So you can d go off drops. I mean, they're awesome for like dropping off ledges and things like that. It's just, if you've got all these, you know, six inch or 12 inch or 18 inch, like ledges or rocks or, you know, things that you're slamming into with the front wheel, you know, it's going to be a little bit stiff for that, but they both gave me like an incredible amount of confidence, incredible, incredible amount of feel. I like them both so, so much for like for doing jumps and corners and drops. The suspension is awesome. Love it. Love it on both the bikes. And so I'm giving that one a tie. So both the YZ and the KX get a point right there. Boom. So good for that. That's an awesome one. Uh, suspension. Moving on to chassis. Now with chassis, I'm talking about the frame. I'm talking about brakes. I'm talking about wheels. I'm talking about levers. I'm just kind of like chassis is a big, a big all encompassing one here. Okay. So again, along with the forks and, and the, and the suspension, both of these bikes have a really planted feel. They feel really good. They feel really settled, you know, as far as just like having confidence on the bike isn't just flopping around all over. I felt really confident on both the bikes. I really liked it. Um, I give a little bit of an edge over to the KX on the narrow feeling of that bike. It's kind of well documented that Yamaha has like a little bit of a wider feel, especially on like their 450s, but the Yamaha just the, the way that the radiators are and the way that the frame is, it just feels a little bit wider. Whereas on the, on the KX, it's got a narrow feeling. They've actually kind of canted the radiators inward a little bit. You can see it when you get on the bike, like you get on the bike and normally if you're, if you're sitting on the bike, normally your radiators would be kind of perpendicular with the general line of your motorcycle. I don't know if that makes sense. You know, if you drew a line between, you know, between your front wheel and your rear wheel, 
uh, and you've got that big line right there, your mo your radiators come at a cross section, a 90 degree cross, you know, angle to that main line of your motorcycle on the Kawasaki. It's they're actually canted in just a little bit. Like the outsides of the radiators are forward a little bit of the insides of the radiators and kind of interesting. And it, it makes it just a little bit more narrow. And then the frame is super narrow. And when you're riding it, thing feels like a knife. I mean, it's awesome. I love that. Um, I, also, the Kawasaki lets you move the foot pegs just a little bit. So it's not a lot. You're moving it maybe about a centimeter or maybe a half centimeter, 10 millimeters, something like I guess 10 millimeters would be a centimeter. <laughs> oh, boy. But anyway, I wish that the pegs moved back, but they do move down. So you can move them down just a little bit. Kawasaki does that. I think that all the manufacturers should do that. Let us adjust our foot pegs just a little bit. Helps, you know, helps with taller people. They're, all these bikes are letting us adjust where, where most of them are letting us adjust the bars, handlebars, just a little bit. So why not let us adjust the foot pegs? Um, and so Kawasaki does that. As far as the kickstands, both of these bikes have kickstands and both of them suck. I mean, I was getting my boot caught. I know it depends on the boots, but on the Yamaha, I was getting my boot caught on the big spring. The, y- the Kawasaki also has a big old gnarly spring on their, on their uh, kickstand, and I haven't had my boot getting caught on that one, which is why I haven't changed it yet, but it just sticks out like an outrigger out there. It totally sucks. On the Yamaha, I went and got one of those uh, Fastway um, the, the fast way kickstands. And I was going to do that on the, on the Kawasaki, but I've just been lazy and haven't done it yet. So I, but in order to do that, you have to have different foot pegs and a different foot peg mount and all this stuff. So it's expensive to do, to move to that. And I just didn't do it, but I don't like the kickstands, the kickstand on the Kawasaki. Not only does it stick out too far when you go to put the bike down on it, the bike tips over too far. I think, I mean, it's got a good wide foot in there, but it just feels like the bike tips over a little too far, which then puts a lot of weight on it. And if you, if you're putting it down in wet dirt, <clears throat> wet mud or, or whatever, or sand, it'll just keep pushing and push that bike down and it'll fall over. Um, interesting thing about the Kawasaki, they use some really thin levers. Like they have these little thin clutch lever and brake levers. You'll know what I mean when you go feel one. And I'm like, oh, why did they do that? That's weird. I, I kind of like more of a rounded profile on my clutch lever and brake lever. Um, but to be honest, um, I didn't really notice. It didn't really bother me when I was riding the bike. So it only I only notice it when I'm sitting there on the bike, not riding it. I'm like, oh, that's different again, you know. But when I get going, it just it sort of goes into the ether, and I don't think about it. Both bikes use Nissan brakes. Um, and you know, I've had kind of a <clears throat> interesting relationship with Nissan brakes in the past. Some of the time I felt like they were super grabby on certain bikes, like on some of the betas, I've had a hard time, but on both of the Yam, both the Yamaha and the Kawasaki, they don't have, I haven't really had an issue. And I think that the Nissan brakes have been totally fine, you know, so not going to complain there they, they both basically use the same thing. The Kawasaki KX250X has a hydraulic clutch, whereas the Yamaha does not. So that's a new thing that Kawasaki is doing. Obviously, both the bikes get got electric start, or they both have electric start. Kawasaki, I think this is the first time they were doing it on their 250s. Um, their motocross bike got it, and then this bike got the electric start. So that's good. Um, and uh, So I'm just going to call this one a tie. I'm going to give one point to the YZ, one point to the KX. I mean, maybe I'd give a teeny, teeny, teeny slight edge to the Kawasaki, on this one, but I'm just going to call it a tie. So they both get one point. Okay. Moving on to the transmission. Now, this one is where, as, as we'll start to see here, this starts to tip in favor of the Yamaha. Yamaha puts a six speed transmission in that bike in the YZ 250 FX. A lot of people call it the WR transmission, whatever. It's a wide ratio transmission. It's got a low first gear, second, low second gear, you know, <clears throat> you got a little bit bigger gap there between third gear and on up, but it's got six speeds on the Yamaha and it comes in really handy. If you're going to do an off-road bike, it's nice to have a little bit wider spacing between the gears, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit wider spacing between the gears. And, um, it's nice to have that sixth gear because so often when you're 
out doing off-road riding or whatever, you're going to have some forest road that might be for a mile or two. Or, you know, just you're connecting trails together. And when you've only got a five-speed motocross style, close ratio transmission like you have in the Kawasaki, I mean, it's, it's not good. Uh, it's not ideal, I guess, is the way I should characterize that. Yeah, it works fine. And I know that tons of us out there or tons of you out there or whatever have used, you know, the five-speed motocross gearing forever. And does it work? Yes. Can you get by with it? Yes. But I just don't like to have my RPMs like that high. If I want to take the bike 55 miles an hour down a dirt road somewhere, I'd rather be able to click up into sixth gear and keep my RPMs much lower and be able to just, you know, clip on through. You're going to get better fuel mileage if you're doing some of these longer rides. Um, so yeah, it really, really bugs me that Kawasaki didn't put a five, a six speed gearbox in the bike. It just goes to show that they're not really making new. A lot of times they're not really making new models. They're literally just marketing, making a teeny, teeny tweak or a couple tweaks to an existing model and then calling a new model. Honda did that. You know, Yamaha has done that to a certain extent. Kawasaki has done like the bare minimum. Like all they did with this bike is change the valving a little bit, put an 18 inch, you know, wheel on the bike, put a kickstand on the bike and say, Hey, look, it's the new model. It's Kawasaki KX 250X. I just would like to see a little bit more go into that. If that makes sense. Lastly, I feel like we need to talk about the air boxes. So normally I wouldn't talk about an air box in a uh, comparison like this, but I feel like I have to now. Um, it's mainly because of the Kawasaki airbox. See, and I'm not even saying that the Yamaha airbox is super great because on the Yamaha, it's the airbox is up on the top in front of you. Kind of your air box and air filter would up be up where your, you know, your fuel tank or your, your fuel cap would be on most other bikes. And they've kind of got it like a flat pancake style or a French toast style air filter. And it doesn't even have that much surface area. So I'm not saying it's the best thing in the world, but when you compare what Yamaha has done with their airbox to what Kawasaki did, it's just better hands down. The Kawasaki airbox is like the worst airbox that I've seen on any dirt bike for a few reasons. Number one, you need a 10 millimeter uh, socket to take out your seat screw. Then you need an eight millimeter socket to take out the other airbox screw. And now you've got the cover off. You used two different tools instead of tool less like most dirt bikes are. And now the airbox is so tight that your filter, you have to like pry on the thing and finagle it to get it out of there. And you're dumping dirt off of your air filter down into the air boot, down into your intake. It's in, it's incredibly easy to do. It's hard to get that thing out without dumping dirt and crud down in there. And it's hard to get it out without tearing the air filter. And then, okay, you go to put a new air filter on and there's a, you know, a plastic cage that you kind of put that foam air filter around like you have on, you know, typical bikes. And it's hard to get that thing in there because there's not enough space. They didn't give you enough space. So you're smashing it in there and kind of rubbing it past the fender and rubbing it past the little subframe. And you're, it's easy to tear the filter or at least pull it kind of halfway off the little filter cage and get it installed where it's there. You could suck dirt through there. So I am sure that people are going to do it in a hurry or a kid's going to do it and they're going to, you know, tear their air boot off or pull it off that cage and suck dirt into the motor because it's just a really, really poor design. The Sherco design was I thought was kind of poor Sherco. You put it, you know, it's your air filter is under the seat and it's kind of hard to get in. This one is worse. So you should have, it should be toolless air filter changes and it shouldn't be so stinking hard. Um, it's the worst air filter, you know, that I've had on any bike. So that's the thing there. I mean, and if you're just, if we look at the five different areas that we looked about, we looked at, we went motor suspension, chassis, transmission, and air box. Of those, if I give one point for each one of those, the Yamaha gets a score of four and the Kawasaki only gets a score of two. And yes, I'm nitpicking here, but that's the whole point of this. This is a, you know, would you rather? And I just have to say that all those things combined, would I rather be on the green one or would I rather be on the blue one? I'd rather be on the YZ. If I'm going to own one and I'm going to have that because of those things, 
all totaled up together, I'd rather be on the YZ. The Kawasaki is an awesome bike. I picked it in my top 10, but I like the YZ just a little bit better. And I'm on record saying that. I'll be on record saying that in the YouTube video, whenever that drops live. I think this podcast will go live before the YouTube one does because I've still got some work to do on the YouTube side, on the editing side, but hey, that's my deal. So motors, I gave to the Yamaha. Suspension was a tie. Chassis was a tie, although maybe a slight edge to the, you know, the Kawasaki. Transmission is fully on Yamaha and airbox is fully on Yamaha. And those are my, you know, those are my thoughts on these bikes. So super fun bikes and uh, had a fun time, you know, kind of doing the would you rather. Hey, remember, if you want to support Dirt Bike Channel, one of the best ways you can do it is by <laughs> entering one of my sweepstakes. You can enter a sweepstakes to win this Kawasaki. Hey, it would be in my best interest to tell you that the Kawasaki is the best thing since sliced bread, you know, because I'm selling, you know, t-shirts and I'm selling jackets and hats and hoodies and, and uh, tie downs. You know, this is one of my prizes. I'm telling you my honest opinions on these things. Yes, it's a great bike. No, it's not my favorite bike. And you can always just take me at face value. You know, it would behoove me to lie to you. You know, that way I could sell more stuff. But I don't, I don't lie. I don't lie to you guys. I tell you my honest opinions, regardless of what that means, regardless of whether that means I might make a little less money or regardless if it means I won't ever get a sponsorship from XYZ, you know, company. But I don't want a sponsorship from Kawasaki or KTM or Yamaha. I want my sponsorships to come from you guys that are listening to these podcasts in the form of you clicking on my links for Rocky Mountain ATV or you buying a shirt or a set of tie downs or a toe strap off my website at dirtbikechannel.com. I would rather be working for you, the regular guy, than working for the you know these big manufacturers. And that's the way I've structured my business and and uh, I feel good about that. So I'm going to be honest with you. I don't review all products. If I really like the product, I'll show it to you. If I, if I don't like the product or I'm not interested in it, I'm not going to show it to you. And that's kind of how I've done things. And it feels good to me. That way I can continue to be positive. I don't have to be tearing things down every once in a while. I will rip on something. But most of the time I keep the reviews positive and I'm not ripping on something. If it's a piece of crap product, I'm not going to show it to you. Fortunately, this Yam this uh, Kawasaki is not a piece of crap. It's an awesome dirt bike with uh, just that piece of crap airbox design. So anyway, <laughs> thanks so much for listening. Uh, hope everyone has a fantastic week and a fantastic weekend, which is upcoming, forthcoming. Make sure you go to my website, dirtbikechannel.com and get entered to win these three motorcycles that I'm giving away before June 30th of 2021. Head over there and get entered. Leave a single track. Thanks, everyone.